unction and utterance for the glory of Jesus Christ. May he be lifted up. In Jesus' name we pray. Church, if you agree, say amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Praise the Lord. What a joy it is to be back together worshiping our Lord and Savior. Let's go ahead, open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, and we're in verses 1 to 22. Acts 4, 1 to 22. And if you do not have a Bible, make sure you put up your hand nice and high because our ushers are coming forward right now and we want to put a copy of God's Word in your lap. So go ahead, our ushers will put a Bible in front of you and it is on page 531 of those Bibles being handed out. Page 531. Here we are in our next message in our series, verse by verse, line by line, through the book of Acts. And if you've been here for more than one week and heard one of these messages or more, you would know the key theme of the book of Acts is witness. And so over the last, since the start of chapter 3, we have been seeing the marks of a faithful witness. Started right here, actually, at the end of chapter 2, even, verses 14 to 41, where we saw the message of a faithful witness is the beautiful gospel. Acts 2, 14 to 41. Then we moved, in the next message, we moved to the mindset that a faithful witness lives by. Acts 3, 1 to 10. The mindset of a faithful witness is a mindset of expectancy. That it's never just another conversation. It's never just another moment. It's never just another Uber ride because when God's glory is on the agenda, he will use that for his glory and the advancement of his kingdom. Then we saw the confidence that we have in our witness. What's the confidence that we have is that God has a plan. God has a plan for the salvation of souls. We saw that in Acts chapter 3, verses 11 to 26. God made the promise that he would draw all kinds of people to himself, and he draws the people. We can be confident in our witness that it's not up to us to save or change lives. That's his job. And that leads to today. So if we have confidence in our witness, what's our testimony of our witness to be? It is to be bold. The testimony of a faithful witness is a bold witness. Hey, question for you, loved ones. Does anyone here feel like it's getting harder to live as a faithful Christian? Anyone? Yeah, me too. Opposition increasing against faithful witness for Jesus in our workplaces. I was just having lunch with my wife uh, yesterday, and she said, you know, we're Christians in the workplace. It just seems like more and more, they're just, how can they live out their, their faith with different laws and regulations being passed down? And we were praying for them. We were praying for Christians in various workplaces. How about in our schools? Students, you know, praise the Lord for his work in Hope Youth. I ask, I ask a young person, you know, in one word, describe what happened at Hope Youth on this past Wednesday. And they said, powerful. That's how we describe it. You know, when I talk to the students, it's, it's not, hey, we played a great game. It's, We were in small groups for an hour and didn't want to leave. That's the spirit of God through the work of God. Pray for Hope Youth, amen? And pray for them as they go into their schools. It's getting harder for them to live as a Christian and not take a hit. Government regulations that are being passed down. In our home, it's getting harder. In even the hobbies that we do. In the entertainment that we have, it's getting harder to stay faithful as a Christian when you look at the media that's coming against. So the key question we must ask ourselves daily is this. The opposition is clear, but in spite of this opposition, here's the key question, ready, loved ones? Will I be bold in telling others about Jesus? That's that's clear, that's all coming, but will I be bold in the face of it? Now let's... There's lots of pictures about boldness and what can come to mind. Some people think, well, if I'm bold, then that means I get red in the face like a cherry tomato and there's spit flying and there's angry tones. And no, what we'll see today 
The Greek word boldness is parousia, and it means this. You'll see it on the screen. It means a, a confidence or freedom in speaking. Biblical boldness is just spirit-inspired courage and confidence to proclaim the gospel in spite of any danger or threat. Parousia, boldness, a freedom to speak from spirit-inspired courage and confidence. You don't have to raise your voice for that. You don't have to get red in the face for that. You're just, if I could sum it up this way, it just means declaring the gospel with, here it is, two words, courageous clarity. Just be clear and be truthful. Courageous clarity no matter what. But there's a problem, and I think you just look at that definition, the biblical definition of boldness, and you'll see it. The problem that you and I face each day is this. Um, so often we're not bold in our witness, are we? We're afraid. Hey, can I just say, as we are meeting before the service there for pre-service prayer, just hit me. You know, Jesus buried fear in the ground with him. Did you know a follower of Jesus Christ never has to live in fear? Just a fear of the Lord himself. But no fear of man. No fear of opposition. No fear of what could happen. The Christian life is the fearless life. We're called to be fearless witnesses. And when we fear God more than man, it's game on. It is game on. We're not often bold in our witness, though, because of our unbelief. And when we start to backtrack in our witness, instead of being courageously cleared when presented with the opportunity, here's what we're refusing to believe. One or all three of these things. We refuse to believe in Jesus and what he's done for us in the gospel. We refuse to believe who we are truly in him because of his work through the gospel. Our security, our identity. And here's the other thing. We struggle to believe that he has equipped us through the gospel for that moment. We look around at the world, we look at our situation, we look at the people God's put around us, and instead of being bold, we are filled with fear. What could happen with my job? Fear of man, fear of outcome, fear of opposition. We're filled with anxiety, and what is the result? Compromised and unfaithful witness as we fear the world over God. But I pray this is such an encouraging night. Loved ones, so good to gather together. Here's the big idea of the text we need to take away from this. And take it into your families and the workplaces coming this week. Let's go. Jesus has overcome our opposition. Say that with me. Jesus has overcome our opposition. Okay, we can do better than that. This church sings really loud, so let's go. Jesus has overcome our opposition. Boom. Let it sink in. I'm not even going to finish the second half yet. Just let that truth sink in. Students, as you walk the halls in your high schools, Jesus has overcome your opposition. Mothers, fathers, Jesus has overcome your opposition. What you will face in the workplace, the comments, the looking down on you for your beliefs. Jesus has overcome that opposition. Fear not. And because Jesus has overcome the opposition, here's what it means for us. We must witness with boldness. We must witness with boldness. Lord, help us. So how do we live as a bold witness? We're going to see three marks of a bold witness. We must increasingly live out each day in the power of the Holy Spirit. If we are to see faith overcome fear. Anyone want to see faith overcome fear? 
Come on. If we are to see faith overcome fear and witness courageously to see Jesus advance his kingdom for his glory, no matter what opposition comes against us, you ready to go? Let's dive in, Hope, all right? Let's stand to honor the authority of God's word. Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. We're not going to read all 22 verses right now. We're just going to go 1 to 4. Ready to go? Read this nice and loud. I love this. Peter and John before the council. Verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Hear the word of the Lord, all God's people said. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let's go. First thing we see right here from verses 1 to 4 is this, that a bold witness remembers with confidence. A bold witness remembers with confidence. What do they remember? Here's it. They remember that God will work his word for his glory. I'll say it again. A bold witness always remembers, right here, that in that situation, no matter what it is, no matter what they're facing, God will work his word for his glory as it is held up. You can't stop it. Everyone say, you can't stop it. You can't stop it. Let's get our context. Here we are in Jerusalem at the temple, specifically in a place called Solomon's Portico. You'll see it on the screen. Remember from last week, it's the porch on the eastern side of the temple where Jesus often taught himself. Now, why are they there? Well, there's tension rising here. Tension is rising and about to boil over between the religious leaders and two apostles named Peter and Peter. And John, why are they so fired up against the apostles? Because a miracle's happened. If you remember from Acts 3, 1 to 10, a man lame since birth, who is now over 40, has been healed by the power of Jesus through Peter. And the crowd of thousands is amazed. Just Jerusalem is in an uproar. That whole pit, just picture thousands of people right there. They're just in an uproar. And so in response to their amazement, Peter gets up, chapter 3, 11 to 26, and he preaches to a crowd about how Jesus healed this man as a sign that Jesus is the only Messiah and God's plan of salvation. And now, this is a crucial moment. We turn to Acts 4, crucial moment for the apostles, crucial moment for the early church. You know why? Because it is the first wave of opposition to come against them. First wave since the church began is right here. It's the first wave of opposition coming against the church. So far, they've been, you saw Acts 2, 42 to 47. There's been so much joy in the Lord, and they're serving together, and the Lord's adding numbers. It'd be real easy to get real comfy. And now the Lord allows the first wave of opposition to come. And the conviction, faith, and boldness of Peter and John is put to the test crucial moment. And so in verses 1 to 4, as we read, after hearing Peter and seeing what's happening, Jewish authorities, they arrive on the scene. They see hear the preaching of Jesus. They see the crowd's response, and they arrive on the scene. And notice the text in verse 2. Go back to it. It says they were greatly annoyed. You know what that means? They're just exasperated by these guys, and they're offended. Hey, here's the first thing we need to see. If you are faithfully preaching the gospel, eventually someone's going to get offended. Can we just stop trying? Like, we don't intentionally go in to try to offend someone. We don't be rude and don't say it in an offensive way. We speak courageously but clearly. But eventually, someone's going to get offended by the truth. And I, so I don't want how I say that to be offensive. But if they're offended by the truth of God, that's between them and him. Our job isn't to be bullies with the truth. Our job is to be clear and courageous with it and to speak it in love and conviction and compassion. So here they are. And so who specifically comes at them? Well, look at verse one. The captain of the temple police force. The temple police force was a group of Levitical priests 
who had been chosen to maintain law and order, and they were charged by the Romans to maintain law and order at the temple. And this chief of the temple police corps, he's second in command to the high priest. So he's a big wig. And next you see, look, go back to the text, verse one, the Sadducees. Oh, it's so sad, you see. I can't, I can't resist. I just couldn't, every time I say that, it's just so sad, you see. Just so sad. A religious group made up of wealthy members of the highest class of society. And they had political power. Why? Because the Sadducees were in with the Roman government. That's why the Sadducees and the Pharisees didn't like each other. They were always doing this. The only thing they were united in is getting rid of Jesus. But they hated each other because the Pharisees couldn't stand Rome. And so the Sadducees, what's important to note here, is that they were known for their denial of the supernatural. How do you think that's going to go over with the preaching going on? The Sadducees denied the supernatural. They only looked at the first five books of the Bible as authoritative, the Pentateuch, and they denied the miracles and resurrection of the dead. Well, notice what they're preaching. Jesus has resurrected from the dead. They're going to have a problem with it. And so recall that they, along with the Pharisees, were responsible for putting Jesus to death for claiming that he would be resurrected from the dead, for claiming that he's the Messiah. Just a short time earlier, most scholars think just 100 days earlier, Jesus' death from this point. And so the result is they were annoyed. They saw the apostles as agitators and heretics who were looking to make the leaders look bad, and the Sadducees just love to hang on their position, so they're feeling threatened right now. And so they take action. What do they do? Go to the text. They arrest Peter and John, and they throw them in prison overnight. You say, wait a second, why'd you throw them in overnight? Because they were going to be hauled before the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish Supreme Court, I was taking a walk by the Supreme Court yesterday, praying over everything going on there, and it would be like you and I going to the Supreme Court and standing before all of the judges there, all right? And so the Sanhedrin only met in the mornings. It was Jewish law. And so notice verse four, in spite of this. Verse four, but many of those who'd heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. See what happened there? How, how effective is the opposition being right now? Nah. Many people heard Peter preach the gospel, repented of their sin, believed in Jesus as Lord and Savior, and the church grew to 5,000 men. That's not even including the women. And most scholars believe it includes the women, and it is about 10,000 at this time. And so here's the thing we need to see. You'll see it on the screen. The messenger can be stopped, but the message never will be. Why? Because God will work his word for his glory. And here's the thing that hit me afresh as I was prepping this. Do you notice this? We actually don't know if Peter and John ever saw at this point how many people responded to the gospel that was preached. We don't know. Notice the order of the text. Verse 3, they get chucked in prison, and then we're told. We don't know if they even knew. That's encouraging for you and I today. You think, you think hey, hey, after they, they preach the gospel, maybe they don't see anything happen. They get arrested, they get thrown in prison. You think they were tempted to sit in prison wondering if any of their witness made a difference? Like, did anyone respond? Did it? Did they? Tempted maybe with some doubts about, you know, is it worth it? Don't forget, you say, well, these guys were single. Uh, actually, Peter had a wife. Peter had a family. And so he's like, what's gonna happen to them? You think he's tempted? I'm sitting in prison here. Hey, question, bring that into today. You ever get discouraged after sharing your faith and seemingly just getting the getting opposition or an apathetic response as a result? You ever get discouraged? You ever tempted with that? Is God really working his word for his glory? Is he? Is he going to do that? I want to encourage us tonight, loved ones, regardless of whether we see it or not, you can't stop the power of God's word in the heart of the one he is working in. Why? Because it's living and active. The word of God is spirit-given and spirit-driven. And you and I, every time, by God's grace, in his power, we proclaim the beautiful gospel, we proclaim the truth of God's word, it goes to work. And his word is not bound. Whether you see it or you don't, 
but you, will you believe and proclaim it? Will you trust it and proclaim it? See, remember, the work of the word can't be stopped. Proclaim it. The simple message that God has given to us, the beautiful gospel, the person and work of Jesus, every opportunity you get. All the time, every time. A bold witness remembers with confidence, even if I don't see it, God will work his word for his glory. Even if I get shut down, you can't shut down the message. Bam. Good luck with that. And with this, we see that in the face of opposition, number two, uh, a bold witness responds with courage. So in remembering with confidence, I love this, in remembering with confidence that the word of God will work for the glory of God, God will see to that. How are we to respond to the opposition we face? With confidence, with courage. Why? I love this. Because Jesus has given all you and I need to witness. Jesus, do you believe that? You can hear that truth, but do you actually believe that? That when you're on that Zoom call with your coworkers or now back in the office or, or with that person at the grocery store, and do you believe that he's given you all you need to witness to that person that moment he knows exactly where they're at, why they're there and how they're there and where their heart's at? He's given you all you need, do you believe that? And will you respond in faith? Look at five to seven. Oh, this is so good. Buckle up. On the next day, their rulers, so this is the morning, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? See, the next day, now the scene switches. From the courtyard in the temple to now the courtroom. From the courtyard to the courtroom. As the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, gather in their council chambers. And included in the Sanhedrin, notice how, the whole, don't miss the names. If the Holy Spirit has name dropped a person in there, it's for a reason. Pay attention. Look at the names the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to write here. Included in the Sanhedrin are Annas. Now it says Annas here was the uh, high priest. Verse 6, Annas the high priest. Wait a second, Annas the high priest. Well, remember, for those of you who are here for our study through the book of John, Annas was actually a former high priest that still had great influence over the role, and he still had on, held on to the title. He was actually the father-in-law of the real high priest at that moment, Caiaphas, who you see right here. He's the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the current high priest. And by the way, the high priest was the head of the Sanhedrin. He was in charge, Annas' son-in-law. And then you see these two guys, John and Alexander. We don't know exactly who they are, but we know right from the text that they were members of the priestly or royal family, as you see it at the end of verse 6. Now here's the key. Luke specifically name drops these men to show us that these are the same people. Do these names ring a bell? These are the same people, the same governing body that put Jesus to death just over 100 days earlier. Same guys. It's not like these guys weren't aware of what happened at Passover. So let's get a pic. Let's just put yourself in the disciples. This is incredible. Here's a picture of the Sanhedrin. Here's what it looked like. Okay, put it on the screen. See that? 71 judges, leaders, seated in a semicircle. And anyone who was being questioned or on trial would stand in the middle. And here's the thing. If you're Peter and John, you know that you're standing, really? You know that you're standing in front of the assembly of the most powerful, wealthy, influential, and well-educated men in the entire nation. I mean, the Jewish leaders, they brought the firepower. They wanted to crush Peter and John right here. They did not want the preaching of Jesus to go beyond that room ever again. They're bringing all the big wigs out. And Peter and John, listen, you're, you're in their shoes, you're a fisherman.
Just sit with that for a moment. How are you feeling right there? Be honest. You're in the middle. 71 judges ready to crush you. And to top it off, this same governing body right here, the highest court in the land just a short time ago sentenced Jesus to death. Here's the thing, for proclaiming the same truth that you just proclaimed. How are you feeling right now? If you're Peter and John. Do you, do you think maybe you'd feel a bit intimidated right now? Just a little bit? Let's just be honest, yes. Right there, just a tiny bit. Would you be having some flashbacks? Uh, I actually remember when Jesus stood before these guys. How'd it go for him? How, how would you respond in this moment? When you're on trial. When your faith is on trial. Maybe some of you right now in your families and workplaces, your faith is on trial. You stand your ground and respond in courage. Our God is faithful. Amen? Amen. You respond in confidence and courage. Our God is faithful. Would your faith in Jesus right here trump your fear of man right there? See, right here in this, and put yourself in that situation, whatever that is for you, that invokes that fear. Right there, Jesus has given you all you need to witness. The question for you and I is not, has he given us what we need? The question is, will you respond in faith? And you may say, well, I want to, but I'm intimidated. I'm fearful. I'm feeling anything but courageous. Forget the Supreme Court. I'm intimidated talking to my teammate, to my family member, to my neighbor. Forget the Supreme Court. I'm, I'm intimidated by my neighbor. How can I respond in faith? Faith in what? Question is this. Faith in who? Faith in who? Faith in Jesus. Here's the th We see three, th three things right here. Write these down. Responding by faith. Faith in Jesus in his unbeatable power. In his unbeatable power that lives in us. His undefeatable, his unstoppable power. Watch this. See if you can catch it. Verses 8 to 10. Go back to the text. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today. Let's picture this. He's in front of 71 judges. He says, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus, Christ of Nazareth, and now he goes, look at this, whom you crucified, boom, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. See, Peter responds to the court, how? By going and like, yeah, okay, sorry, sorry, yeah, okay, we'll never do it again. Look, what does he say? He preaches the gospel to 71 of the religious leaders, just boom, to the most powerful leaders in the land who literally have, he, they think, his life in their hands. He's there preaching the gospel. He declares that it is through the name of Jesus Christ this man has been healed. This same Jesus, he says, whom you, verse 10, crucified and killed on a cross just a short time ago. He indicts, he indicts the whole Supreme Court. Wow. He's not running, is he? Because he knows who truly holds his life in his hands. Do you? Do you? You know, we're, I'm reading this book right now called Forbidden Faith. Faith in Forbidden Places. About the persecution of the church overseas. And there's this one testimony that my wife stood out for me the other day. And it's this, it's this missionary who he's in a Middle Eastern country and, um, and he was interviewed. He was put in prison, beaten viciously, comes out. 
And they said, listen, if you keep going on proclaiming the gospel, what do you think is going to happen? And he goes, well, I think one of two things is going to happen. Either I'll be killed or I'll be put in prison and continue to preach the gospel. And he says, and which one of those things is bad? He says, there's no bad option here. Just let that sit there for a moment. He says, but in verse 10, he says, all your opposition, all your power, and even the power of death could not defeat Jesus because God, notice verse 10, by the Holy Spirit raised him up from the dead. And you may say this, you may sit here and be like, man, I want that. How could Peter respond this way? The key is in verse eight. Did you catch it? Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. That means filled to the max, filled completely. God himself, the third person of the Trinity, filled with all that he would need in that moment to preach the gospel and witness boldly and courageously. And you may say this, you say, I thought I'm always filled with the Spirit. Aren't I, on salvation, aren't I immediately filled with the Spirit? And yes, at the moment of salvation that you repent of your sin and confess Jesus Christ as Lord, you are baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. No questions asked. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. But remember, we are in need of filling Ephesians 5.18, remember it says, be being filled, be filled with the Holy Spirit again and again and again. A fresh filling for that moment, fresh power of the Lord. One baptism, many fillings, and that's what happens here. The Spirit freshly empowers Peter for the task. And I want you to notice this. The sa- be so encouraged with this. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead empowers Peter to proclaim Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Boom, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead now lives in Peter and hence bring it into today, lives inside each of you and me who have repented of our sin and confessed Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and our true followers of his. Boom, awesome, awesome. Our God is awesome. He can't be defeated and, and God's just doing what he promised. Because God will always fulfill his word. Look at the screen. Luke 12, 1 to 2 says this. And when they, it's not a matter of, and if they. Notice that. Notice Jesus' language right here. Talking to his disciples. He says, and when they bring you before the synagogues. When they bring you before the rulers. When they bring you before the, if you're preaching the gospel, people will get offended sometimes. Because it's the truth of God. And the prince of the power of this world doesn't want it anywhere in it. He says, when they bring you before the authorities, loved ones, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself. Don't sit in the, you know what this means? Don't sit in the prison cell overnight and be like, okay, what should I say tomorrow? If they ask this question, what should I say here? And if they ask this, what am I going to say here? What am I going to say here? What am I going to, how many of us just do this in our heads? Again, what am I going to say if they say this? What am I going to say? He says, stop. Don't. Be anxious. Don't think about how you're going to defend yourself or what you should say for, look at this, the Holy Spirit, the very one Peter's filled with here, the very one all true followers of Christ are filled with, will, look at the promise, will teach you. He will give to you in that very hour what you ought to say. In the Uber, Lord, fill me. Holy Spirit, fill me. In the workplace, Holy Spirit, fill me. In the neighborhood, Holy Spirit, fill me. In the grocery store, Holy Spirit, fill me. Expectancy, looking around, Holy Spirit, fill me right now. And he will give to you what you need. We have to understand this. Boldness doesn't flow from anxiety. You know what flows from anxiety? Fear. It's a vicious cycle. Fear produces anxiety, anxiety. Fear flows from anxiety. Boldness doesn't flow from anxiety. Fear does. Boldness is the overflow of courage and faith in the Lord, in who he says he is, and knowing that he'll do what he says he'll do, that in that moment you'll have what you need. 
by the spirit that lives in you. And if I, and if I, want, I want to encourage you with this, loved ones, man, if there was ever a day the need for boldness, huh? Come on. If you are saved in Jesus, that person or situation you're fearful of or intimidated by has no power over the God that fills you. There's no power. He's unbeatable. He's undefeated. So question, are you asking the Holy Spirit to fill you when you're driving to work, when you're going into that meeting for your family devotions, when you're talking to it, are you asking the Spirit to fill you and then stepping out by faith in witness knowing that nothing can stop him and he will work his word for his, the glory of Jesus Christ. There's the first thing we see. Faith in Jesus' unbeatable power. Secondly, how can we respond with courage? Here it is. Faith in Jesus' unshakable authority. Faith in Jesus' unshakable authority. Go back to the text, verse 11 and 12. Peter goes on. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Talk about boldness. Peter reminds the leaders that they were builders. The word builders there means the religious leaders were charged with building up the house of God. Yet in their unfaithfulness to God, they have rejected. The word rejected there means despised or turned away from the very cornerstone of the house of God, Jesus Christ. Notice Peter's quoting Psalm 118 verse 22 here and how Jesus is the fulfillment. Psalm 118 is a messianic psalm. Jesus is a fulfillment of that. And then in verse 11, he calls Jesus the cornerstone. What's the cornerstone? Check out the screen. Here it is. The cornerstone is the foundation stone. It's that one that's lit up there. It is the first stone set in construction of a building's foundation. And it is absolutely imperative to get the cornerstone right. You got to get the cornerstone right. Because notice the, notice the picture. All the other stones in the structure will be set in reference to that stone. And the position and strength of the entire structure is determined by it. If you reject the cornerstone, if you get that wrong, everything collapses, including in your homes, including in the church. And it grieves my heart to see so many churches walking away and rejecting the cornerstone setting their foundation on the things of this world to try to appease it, try to win favor with it, walking away, imploding. How do you think it's going for these religious leaders trusting in other foundations? Their own personal piety. How do you think it would go for you? See, today... Jesus is the cornerstone, the capstone, the head, the one with all authority over the house of God. He is building the church. He has all authority over all things and is our unshakable foundation on which we stand. In every situation, he does not bow the knee to any opposition we face. And look at verse 12 again. You say, how do you know this? Go back to verse 12, I love it. And there is salvation in no one else because there's only one who has all authority. There's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. See, no other name is higher. No other name is greater. No other name is stronger than the name above all names, the name of Jesus. Jesus is the exclusive Messiah, and all will bow the knee to him. Hey, believers, here's the challenge for us. Are you standing in courageous faith in the authority of Jesus in your witness? knowing that he has all authority over that moment that he's brought you to. He's got all authority over that person you're speaking to. Authority over that situation. He is an unshakable foundation for you in that moment. You need not run. You can stand courageously because of his authority that he is going to do what he's going to do for his glory and your good and will not be stopped. He's the cornerstone. We can be confident. And if you're here and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it is not an accident that God has brought you here tonight. Let me ask you a question. 
What name are you trusting in for salvation? What's your cornerstone you're banking on? Well, I'll bank on my, my good behavior will get me to heaven. If, as long as I'm better than the next person. It doesn't work like that. You're, you and I will never be good enough to get to heaven. That's why we needed a perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ. And our sin that separates us from God and leads us to hell for eternity was laid on him so that we could have a chance at salvation by repenting of our sin and saying, Jesus, I confess you as Lord. What cornerstone are you relying on for that? See, there's only one Messiah that can save you, forgive you of sin, and offer eternal life in the presence of God. And that's the name of Jesus. Will you repent and confess him as Lord? There's no other name. Because here's what this leads to. Faith in Jesus' unbeatable power, his unshakable authority, watch this, leads to an undeniable recognition in that moment, an undeniable recognition through us. Look at verses 13 and 14. Now when they, that is the Sanhedrin, saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Awesome, you see that? In response to Peter, the Sanhedrin is absolutely stunned. They are astonished at how he, an uneducated common man, what that means is this, no rabbinical school training. They knew Peter hadn't been to the religious schools they had been to. He was unskilled. He was considered ordinary. This is an ordinary guy. What's going on here? There's nothing special about him in their eyes. And actually, take it one step further. That word common there, uneducated common men, you know the Greek word for common is idiotes. Hey, newsflash, uh, what English word do you think we get from Greek word idiotes? Any ideas? There's how Peter and John are described. Just a bunch of idiots for Jesus. There's nothing special. But notice they're stunned that they could speak with such boldness. Clarity in the power in the face of such odds before 71 of the highest judges. What is going on here? How could they act like that? But they recognized one thing with clarity. These men had been with Jesus. And they had, hadn't they? Three years watching, asking, listening, and witnessing his power. And no one could deny it. And believers, let me encourage you with this. You may not have ever gone to seminary. Seminary is a nice thing. It's a gift and it's a school. It's a gift of the Lord for training. Yeah, sure, it's great. But you may not have ever gone to seminary. And you may not be highly trained or skilled in reading the Bible at this point. You may even be a new believer. There's people who've been saved in this church within the last few weeks. You may be even a new believer. But I want to encourage you with this. Ready? Put it on the screen, loved ones. God already factored in your inabilities when he saved you. I'll say it again. God already factored in your and my inabilities when he saved us. God is not looking for help on the mission. He's looking for those who call for help. You take all your degrees, you take all that. He says, have you been with me? I'm the one who gives you what you need. So the most important question, church, isn't have you been to seminary? The most important question is, have you been with Jesus? It's not have you been to seminary? Have you got all the letters behind your name? Have you had all the experience? It's have you been with Jesus? Have you been with him morning by morning, day by day, abiding with him in the word for that uncommon communion? Not just opening it for two minutes, okay, then rushing off to the next thing to fill yourself with the world. Abiding with him, listening so you can recognize his voice when the spirit gives you those words. How can we expect to respond when we don't recognize the voice? Have you been with Jesus, loved ones? So that when people see you in the trial, 
facing that opposition with confidence, when they see you in the struggle and there's hope and strength and peace, when they see you going through the pain and they see the joy of the Lord and the hope of the Lord and the comfort of God and it's not what they expected and they're astonished. They see you walking with integrity in the face of so much compromise in the workplace. When they see you living with generosity in a day and age that just says, keep for yourself, there's all this recession and this and this, and they see radical generosity of your time and talents and treasures, when they see purity and holiness, when you're not the one looking at pornography and everyone else on your team is, when they listen to you speak, do they see someone who's been with the Savior? Grace, truth, Love, not anger, not harshness, not gossip, not criticism. They can't deny you've been with him because that's what's common in this world. And they see this undeniable recognition. Are they recognizing a picture of the Savior through you? Is he your priority? What is your next step to get with Jesus? The greatest thing your coworkers need is for you to be close to Jesus, to share with him to share with them the beautiful gospel. Boldness for God is fueled in the presence of God. And here's the key. Here's the key. You say, well, there's so many things competing. I get it. Life can get busy, right? Look at, watch this quote by Oswald Sanders. We are only as close to Jesus as we choose to be. You say, well, I don't feel close to Jesus. or I, You're only as close to Jesus as you choose to be. Intimacy with Jesus is open to any who choose to pay the price to be so. That means saying no to a lot of other things that this world says yes to. Opportunities, engagements. There are times I've been out and I say, it's time to go home. I say, oh, what's going on in the morning? It's only eight o'clock. And you're like, I got the most important meeting of the day in the morning. It starts at 4.30. It's a meeting with Jesus. You can't miss it. And expect to stay faithful and witness and bold. You can't. He's the one who fills you. He's the distinction. Are you willing to pay the price to be so? What's the step you need to take? A bold witness remembers with confidence that God will work his word for his glory responds with courage, knowing that Jesus has given us all we need. And from this, lastly, is this. A bold witness resolves with conviction. Resolves with conviction, what? To obey God over man. To obey God over man. And the question is, will you? Will I? Look at 15 to 22. Let's read. This is incredible. But when they had commanded them to leave the council. So the Sanhedrin says, okay, you guys get out of here. We don't know what to do with you. We got to convene here. They say, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And we can't deny it. I love when God authenticates the truth, huh? Can't deny that. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let's warn them to speak no more to anyone in his name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. So here they are commanding the government commanding that the Christians cannot preach the gospel. You can't preach or teach anymore in Jesus' name. Now watch this, verse 19. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we've seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, the Sanhedrin let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Watch this. After seeing the boldness of Peter and John and the healed man standing before them, they removed them from the courtroom and have no idea what to do. So why? They, the Sanhedrin, remember, they loved their position of power and they feared the city turning against them. Anything to keep their power seat at the table. And they knew they couldn't deny what had happened because the man was over 40. They're like, well, he's way beyond healing age for this. And so all the people were praising God and those people wouldn't be pleased 
if the disciples were punished. So look at verse 18. The best plan they can come up with is to command or threaten them not to preach or teach the gospel anymore. Threaten them with prison. Threaten them with beatings. Maybe even death. And notice the reply. Peter and John 19 and 20. Oh, may it be so, Lord. Give us the conviction, the resolve. Peter and John say that no matter what, you give your beatings, you give your jail time, even our own death, Christ be magnified. They will obey the command of God to preach the gospel because they can't help but speak of what they've seen. It was their divine mandate. And if you are a Christian here today, it is yours and mine as well. It's not up for debate whether that stops or not. Now let's get some clarity here. It's very important right now. The government, notice what's happening in this text. The government is ordering them to not preach the gospel again, saying you can't do that. And today, here's what this means. Listen carefully. Christians should obey governments. Except when they are, listen, as they are in this text, very clearly and very explicitly commanding us to disobey God's word. You may not like the speeding laws. You need to obey them out of submission to Christ. You may not agree with some of the laws that are passed, but are they commanding you to disobey God's word? Are they? See, here's the key that we see from the text. It's not what we want God's word to say, and then we twist it so we can keep the so-called freedoms and comforts that we like, which is so common these days. But it's what God's word actually says. And this is where we need wisdom from the Holy Spirit. We need discernment. We need clarity. And we need counsel that fears the Lord. And Hope Ottawa, I caution you greatly. I have been so thankful for how this church has followed the Lord over the last two and a half, three years now, especially in the face of pandemics and restrictions and all of that. I hope, Ottawa, I caution you, do not make your preferences God's principles. Don't twist the word of God to say what it doesn't say so you can live out your preferences. And as I said, it has been very humbling and a joy to see you following him over these last few years, even when it got really hard. But the bold witness resolves to obey God over man. Will you? See, it's only fitting right now that we finish by coming coming to the communion table and remembering our example, our perfect example, our Savior, the one who lived a perfect life, get this, Jesus, of a perfectly bold witness and who has promised to empower us in fulfilling our mission to be his witnesses. See, Jesus lived with an unshakable confidence in God that he would work his word for his glory. And at all times and in all things, Jesus responded in perfect courage in his witness, no matter what came against him. And he resolved at all times with perfect obedience to obey the will of his father over the will of man that came against him, even to the point of death on a cross, so that all who repent of their sin and confess him as Lord may be saved. And the two elements we remember him with today are perfect witness, the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. The bread, the bread representing his body which was crushed beyond recognition. And the juice representing his blood that was shed to cover every sin we have committed, every sin we are committing right now, and every sin we will ever commit, covered through the blood of Jesus Christ, that we may walk in victory over sin and have new life in him. So 
as we take these elements here, this is a sacred moment right here. Just minimize the shuffling, minimize the distractions, and it's time to get low before the Lord and reflect. Scripture commands us to examine ourselves. 1 Corinthians 11, 28 and 29 says this, let a person examine himself then, and then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We're not to come flippantly to the table of the Lord. It's a sacred moment. Examine ourselves. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Jesus wants us to get right with him before we take these elements. And so in these next few moments, let's just be still and discerning. Ask him to examine our hearts and let's pray, church. Saying this as the psalmist did. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Right here. Holy Spirit, what are the sin in my life that you see that I need to get right with you? Lead me in the way everlasting. And as 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us, that ongoing cleansing of all unrighteousness. So in the quietness of this time, the worship team will sing over this beautiful hymn over us in this time. Let's be still. And ask the Lord to examine our hearts. And, and if you're here and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want to say two things to you. Number one, I am so thankful that God brought you here tonight. I want you in this moment to really sit before the Lord and say, Jesus, am I saved? Do I know if I died tonight that I would be with you with et in eternal life in your presence or would I be in hell? And as he leads, confess Say, Lord, I'm a sinner. And you, Jesus, are the only Messiah, the Savior. Forgive me. I confess you as Lord. I want to follow you. And you will have new life right now. And I would love, after the service, for you to come up and talk to us about, we want to share with you how to take your next steps in your walk with the Lord. Let's go to the Lord right now.